I would say that you're missing the point. What do you mean? I mean that we've talked about this. We've stressed this time and time again is that um, a lot of people will get tied up in the intricacies of the whole life policy. Is it direct? Is it non-direct? And if you look at the entirety of infinite banking and using this strategy, I think we've said it before, is that the product, the policy is only 20% makes up 20% of the returns, right? Do we want that policy to be as efficient as we can possibly get it? Absolutely, but it's only making up 20%. If we take that cash value, right, and we put that money to work in investments and purchasing assets that cash flow and appreciate, man, that's where we're going to get the 80% of the returns. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. And today what we're going to be talking about is some really big changes that have happened in our industry, and they happened earlier this year. Today, what we're going to be touching on is what happened, why it happened, and then what you can do about it. Anthony, these changes happened a few months ago. Do you mind kind of taking us back and maybe filling us in on some of your reactions after you heard about some of these changes? I would tell you, when I first heard this, I was excited. I, I, I think that these changes are good overall mm -hmm. for the industry for policyholders now and for policyholders in the future. And they also made a change to the MEC line. So I was a little excited thinking we can put some more cash value in. Mm -hmm. So I, I was I was hopeful when I heard about these changes. Um what were some of your what was your reaction? Same. When some of the articles came out, they started talking about uh, how uh the ability to put more cash into a policy. And so I was excited about that. So uh, we spent a little more time since then looking at these. And uh, at the end of this, if you stick around, we'll kind of give you our, uh, our, our stance on what we found out. Perfect. Awesome. So Cameron, why don't you kind of set the table? What or why did they, why did they make these changes? Sure. So the, the reason that they made these changes is because we have been in one of the lowest interest rates environments that I think we've ever been in. Uh, for probably the last 10 years or so. And so a lot of these insurance companies are looking for a yield, right? They've got all these premium dollars coming in and they're trying to find a place to put it. And uh, those interest rates, as some of you may know, back in the early 80s is you could put money into a CD and get 10, 12%. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just not the case anymore. Now it's very difficult to uh, find those rates. And so um, the insurance companies have been lobbying to change uh, there's a contract rate inside the policy. It's a gross crediting rate of 4%. And so they've been lobbying to get that changed for a while. And last year with COVID and everything else, uh, they kind of snuck this in, uh, in some of the legislation. Well, let's clarify where did that 4% guarantee come? Like where, how was that 4% determined? Yeah. That 4% is made up of really kind of three pieces. One, it's a gross, gross crediting rate. So that means insurance companies, are going out there and they're finding uh, a yield in, on their investments and everything else. They bring that in. And then what they do is they deduct administrative expenses. And then they also deduct mortality expenses. And that shows up on somebody's policy, that net number as their guaranteed rate of return. Now, one thing I think is interesting, if you notice, every mutual insurance company has a guarantee of 4%. Yep. Right. And they're, why, how come they're all four? It's actually mandated. Is uh, back in 1984, it was legislation that was put in there, and this is when they implemented the MEC line. And essentially, what that MEC line did was it set kind of a ceiling, and that ceiling uh, essentially communicated to them that hey, uh, if you put too much money inside of an insurance policy, is we're going to tax you more like an investment than insurance. And so that's kind of where it came out of his early 80s. Okay, so they made two changes. First one you're going to talk about is they made a change to the guarantee. Yep. And then they also improved the MEC line. They did. So why don't you dive a little deeper into what happened with the, with the guarantees? Sure. So on the guaranteed side is we used to start at 4%, right? What we just touched on. And then it used to be minus administrative, minus mortality, and we get to our guarantees. Now what they've done is they've changed that 4%. They've moved it down to 2%. Mm. And so that's 2% gross crediting rate. And then from there, what you're doing is you're deducting administrative and mortality expenses. And that shows up as the guarantees on the policy. 
So by lowering that to that 2% and gets us to that number of, of just kind of lower, um, the result of that is actually it's going to provide a lot more breathing room for these insurance companies that are out there looking for yield. And so uh, the impact of that is that it's going to save uh, or it's going to be a blessing to a lot of uh, the insurance companies out there that may not be as financially stable as others. Uh, we just did a podcast uh, last week. Uh, that was talking about uh, a mutual insurance company that was moving from a uh, mutual to a stock company. And so there's others out there that have uh, some of these kind of liabilities that they're carrying on the books. And so I think that that's going to help a lot of them mm -hmm. um, kind of alleviate uh, some of that instability. Anthony, uh, can you maybe give us an example or provide some insight on how some of those guarantees will relate to the policy? Sure. Now, one thing I think a lot of people don't realize that like how those guarantee how that cash value and really how that death benefit is determined. Mm -hmm. And the way that is determined is that, you know, every policy has a maturity date. Uh, a lot of them are a hundred and some of them are 121. But what that means is that their design, let's just say that at a hundred, at age a hundred, your cash value is going to equal your death benefit. Or if it's 121, then those two are going to meet at, at 121. And if you look at your life insurance illustration, uh, those two numbers, at whatever that maturity date, are going to be equal. Mm -hmm. Thus, if... And so right now, that they're currently doing the, using the crediting rate of 4%. Now, if we lower that crediting rate to 2%, and... and but we're still going to have the death benefit equal the cash value. Then what that means is for the same premium, that's going to buy less death benefit. Which when it's, we're talking about your mama's life insurance, mm -hmm. that's going to be a big deal because those are designed for death benefit. So in order to get that death, same death benefit, your premiums are going to have to be higher. Okay. Go ahead. But the way we design it is, is going to be different, right? We're not designing it for cash value. I'm sorry. We're not designing it for death benefit. <laughs> we are designing it for cash value. And we design it differently. You know, your mom is, is uh, how much is the, what death benefit do I need? Well, so the, we back into the premium. Mm -hmm. We design it where you decide a premium and then we back into the death benefit. But because of this, that the death benefit is going to be lower. And what, what that means, and this ties into the other change that they made, is that's going to affect the MEC line. Now, Cameron, if you didn't know, the MEC line is a ratio between cash value and death benefit. Okay, so if we lower the death benefit with the same amount of cash value, it's going to MEC. So what they added on to this bill is they change, actually, they made the MEC line calculation better. Like, let's say, for example, that your premium and it was 20 grand a year. Okay. Okay. And that would equal a death benefit of a million bucks. Like, I'm, I'm totally just shooting these out. I don't know. Yeah. They're, they're somewhat close. Totally but, made them up. Right. right now. Yeah. But now, under the new laws, with these new guarantees, that same 20,000 isn't going to buy a million. Let's say it by, we don't know what that number is yet, but let's say it's 800,000. Now, if you had that same cash value in those two policies, with the old MEC rule, the new policy is going to MEC. So what they did is they changed the MEC calculation. So these new policies, when they're designed similarly, even though there's a lower death benefit and the cash value is the same, it's still not going to MEC. Great explanation. What uh, comes to my mind is a quote from Todd Langford, mm. right? Is when I heard about this early in the year, I got kind of excited because I thought it was going to have a tremendous impact. But as we kind of start diving into it, uh, we realize that it may not be so. And so the quote that comes to mind is that there's no deals in life insurance, right? What does that mean? That means you can't have your cake and eat it too. Anthony. That's exactly <laughs> what it means. Is just like we often talk about. Hey, listen, right? You can't have high cash value and high death benefit, right? It's got to be one or the other. 
You can't have high early cash value and tremendous growth on the back end, right? You're going to give up one of those two. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing in this case is, um, right, there's going to be a trade-off, right? Your low, your your guarantees are going to lower, but your non-guarantees may be higher, right, is kind of what we're coming to uh, 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 the conclusion on. And so, Anthony, if someone were to call you up today, a client called you up and said, hey, Anthony, what should I do, right? Should I buy a policy now, hurry up and rush, or should I wait? What would you? What would be your advice? Well, I, what I anticipate is going to happen, there is going to be a lower guarantee, mm -hmm. okay? But there's also going to be a lower death benefit. And so, the costs in that policy are going to be lower. So, I, I believe the cash value, the guaranteed cash value is going to be less, but it's not going to be as it's not going to be cut in half. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but also what I would say is right now we can get a guarantee of four. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like with the new policies. So it is for me, if I could have, cause what, this is what I think is going to happen. Uh, these policies are going to have a lower guarantee and, and the, with the potential higher dividends. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'd rather have a higher guarantee and lower dividends than a lower uh, guarantee and a potential for more dividends. Hmm. So I I would not wait. Okay. I, I, I don't see that being in the best interest. And I, I think the policies are, I, I think the policies are all going to be good. Yeah. But I think if I had to choose, I'd, I'd, I'd want to get one with a, the 4% guarantee. Yeah. Same question to you, Cam. What What would you say? I would say that you're missing the point. What do you mean? I mean that we've talked about this. We stress this time and time again is that um, a lot of people will get tied up in the intricacies of the whole life policy. Is it direct? Is it non-direct? And if you look at the entirety of infinite banking and using this strategy, I think we've said it before is that the product, the policy is only 20% Mm -hmm. makes up 20% of the returns, right? Do we want that policy to be as efficient as we can possibly get it? Absolutely, but it's only making up 20%. If we take that cash value, right, and we put that money to work in investments and purchasing assets that cash flow and appreciate, man, that's where we're going to get the 80% of the returns. And so, you know what? At the end of the day, I, I am not going to put too much weight on these changes. I think I'm going to go put more research into finding opportunities uh, to put my cash into. Good point. Now, at the beginning, we talked about what our initial reaction was when we heard this. Mm -hmm. And now that we know more about it, what's your reaction now? Uh, I was really excited early on and I've kind of tempered that excitement. And uh, you know what? I think that uh, it's going to be pretty status quo moving forward. Yeah. I, I think what's going to happen is I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I'm not, I'm not excited anymore. Yeah. Uh, I tell you, I like it because it gives some breathing room to the insurance companies. And remember, we own the insurance company. Great point. Right? Yeah. So we want them to be successful. We only work with mutual companies, meaning they're owned mutually by the policyholders. So we want them to succeed. What I can see happening is there'll be a lower guarantee and... I I think as interest, particularly as interest rates rise, the dividends will be higher. Mm -hmm. And one thing I could see happening, insurance companies have done this before, is they like close they have these close the book of business, meaning that there may be a different uh, dividend on policies before 2021, and then maybe potentially a higher one in uh, policies in 2020 uh, uh, going forward. Right, because if you have a policy now, we want to make sure that the company is going to be profitable and going to have that breathing room going forward. So I I I, I think that this is good in the minutia, but mm -hmm. just like you said, in the big picture, I don't see this being being a big issue. It's more important to start spend that time looking into opportunities, but. We've, we've been getting some questions about it, mm -hmm. right? And there, there's some articles about it. So we, we wanted to put some content out. But the one thing, I, I got excited when I started reading some of these articles. But the problem is these articles are all based on using 
your mama's life insurance. Yeah, the old kind. Right? So when they're talking about the mech line, they design it very different. So they're getting excited for it because maybe finally there's going to be more cash value. But the way we design it, it, it's always been that way. Yep. Great point. And I, I, I'll just emphasize one of the things that you said in there is, if anything, to me, this highlights the importance of doing business with a mutual insurance company is because at the end of the day, those those dividends and those non-guarantee, that non-guaranteed money has got to go somewhere and it's going to go to the owners of the company. And if we're working with a mutual company, that's coming right back to us. Hmm. Well said. Oh, thank you. Let's wrap it up there. What do you okay. think? No, that's perfect. Good note. Awesome. Well, one th- let's add one more thing <laughs> since I don't want to give you that credit. But <laughs> if you have questions about this, maybe you have a policy or maybe you're looking at getting a policy. In in the link of the show notes, there's a, a free discovery call. You're talk with Cameron or I, and we can kind of give you give you some ideas of what you're doing and, and what you can do. So if you're interested, check out that discovery call. Absolutely. Now go make it a fantastic day. Take care. Uh-huh.